Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, folks, wherever you happen to find yourself. My name is Carmen Mazera, and I serve as Executive Director of APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, to which all of your graduate programs belong. We are so happy to see you at another APSIA career-focused webinar, this time featuring the Fulbright Policy Fellowship that is an amazing opportunity for those of you who are early and mid-career professionals and want to continue to build out your international experience. So we're so pleased to have Keegan Scott here to give you all the information that you might need about that opportunity. Keegan's going to speak, and then we'll have a chance to answer all of your personal questions. So as we go through, please feel free to put those in the chat. You can also direct message me if you prefer. And if you run into any technical difficulties, please also feel free to send me a message, and we'll do our best to get you sorted out. This webinar is part of an ongoing series, so as always, be sure to stay in touch with your career office so that you're up to date on all of the different opportunities that APSIA has for you as APSIA grad students. In particular, I want to note next Wednesday, June 7th, we'll have another career briefing, this time on the UN Young Professionals Program, so please feel free to come back for that session. And if you haven't heard of that one, again, circle back to your career office. They have all the information you need to get signed up for that session as well. And so with that, I'm very pleased to turn the floor over to Keegan Scott. And again, I invite you to put questions in the chat or straight to me, and we'll get started. Keegan, please. Great. Thank you, Carmen, for that introduction. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure working with APSIA. Uh, this is, of course, our first year as outreach partners, but nevertheless, we've had a strong relationship with APSIA, the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program, that is. And we're excited to be back uh, with more information about this year's Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, I'll get right into it. Uh, firstly, my name is Keegan Scott. I'm an Outreach and Recruitment Officer with the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program. Uh, and again, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, certainly, we have a busy agenda. Um, we will talk a little bit about uh, the overview, a little bit of an overview of what is the Fulbright Program. Um, I'll discuss why you should consider Fulbrights. I'll then get into the nitty gritty of the eligibility, uh, as well as an overview of the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship. Uh, I'll then elaborate on the participating countries as well as potential placements, application components, and tips. And lastly, there will be space for questions. As Carmen mentioned, you know, feel free to put in the chat or a direct message to Carmen any questions you have, and we'll get to those at the end. All right. So a little bit about Fulbrights. Uh, so what is the Fulbright program? Uh, in short, it is the US government's uh, largest flagship international educational and cultural exchange program. Uh, it's essentially over 160 binational agreements uh, with uh, 160 countries worldwide. And it's an opportunity for uh, folks like yourselves um, to study, teach, or conduct research, uh, or in the case of the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship, um, be a technical specialist. Um, and so as a part of uh, the Fulbright uh, program, we always are striving to have diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility at the forefront of our mission of mutual understanding uh, and exchange abroad. Uh, in short, we understand that public diplomacy is most effective when people of diverse backgrounds and perspectives participate in people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department is committed to addressing barriers based on race, ethnicity, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, religion, geographic location, education, income, socioeconomic status, and of course, other diversity dimensions. Uh, in short, we are looking for a representative applicant pool uh, to represent the, uh, you know, certainly the uniqueness of the United States abroad. Now, a little bit about Fulbright by the numbers. Um, as you can see here, the Fulbright program uh, writ large offers about 8,000 awards annually. Um, we have 900 awards for the U.S. Scholar uh, and Visiting Scholar program. For folks on the call, they might be most familiar with the Fulbright U.S. Student program. Um, and with that, there are about 2,200 awards, uh, 4,000 foreign student awards, and 400 language teaching assistants. So certainly Fulbright is indeed uh, a large piece a large program, a large umbrella, uh, with a lot of different aspects uh, within it. So why you sh why should you consider Fulbrights? Uh, firstly, um, our alumni often oftentimes have said that the program is transformational. 
Um, it's an opportunity to foster relationships, expand your publishing network, become um, you know more multicultural, whether this is in, in your life or in the classroom, serve as an ambassador, gain the professional recognition of a Fulbright scholar, and ultimately join a vibrant alumni network. Now, Fulbright is also uh, supportive in that uh, in those regards. Uh, about 70% of applicants uh, engage with the staff here at the Institute of International Education. Um, you have continued support while in country from, from both IIE as well as the host country staff, the embassy, uh, and so on. And of course, you have access to Fulbright alumni as a resource. I'll get into that a little bit more later um, and how that relates to the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship. Right, but diving right into it. So what is the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship? Uh, so in short, um, it's an opportunity for U.S. early and mid-career professionals and practitioners to serve in, a, in placements around uh, within the foreign government ministries uh, around the world. Um, in short, these fellows will serve as technical specialists in a foreign government ministry or institution, with 80% of the time being immersed in the actual assignments, as well as um, advising and directing new initiatives. Um, and the other 20% of the time will be um, uh, doing what we like to describe as self-directed professional projects. Now, this is really important for folks who have perhaps have seen the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship uh, in previous years. Uh, there used to be a research component. That 20% used to be for research. That is now different. Uh, we wanted to expand that, knowing that, of course, uh, professionals like yourselves uh, might have different goals in mind. So that's really important to note is that now uh, that other 20% of the time is a self-directed professional project. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'd be happy to elaborate on what that looks like uh, later. Uh, but in short, uh, these grants can be anywhere from four to nine months, and there are approximately 12 offered globally. Uh, we do have um, 10 countries that are currently offered um, with the, you know, um, the idea that perhaps, um, you know, people can uh, be, people, rather applicants will apply to one country. Um, you cannot be in multiple countries, contrary to popular belief, although that would be great. Uh, but needless to say, we do offer 12 really wonderful uh, countries uh, with certainly a plethora of uh, placements within those uh, host governments. So a little bit about the eligibility. Uh, and this is really important. Um, so first off, uh, with the Fulbright's U.S. Scholar Program, uh, you must be a U.S. citizen, uh, most importantly. Um, this goes not only for the Fulbright, uh, you know, Public Policy Fellowship, but as well as the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program writ, writ large, and of course, the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. Um, when it comes to the degree requirements, we are looking for folks that have a graduate degree in a public policy related field. Uh, now, this is important because this, of course, you know, this award is open up to all disciplines, as long as there is a public policy emphasis on your work. So even if you are, say, someone who is doing agriculture, but your your interest and your um, experiences within you know, public policy and agriculture, I would encourage you to apply, um, even if your graduate degree is not you know, necessarily an MPA or uh, so on. Uh, we are looking for folks that have three to five years of public policy relevant experience. Uh, now, this is really important um, because we are, again, looking um, at a minimum of three years of experience. So, you know, for a strong and a competitive application, if you have three years of experience, I would encourage you to apply. Now, if you have only one year or two years of experience, I would actually encourage you to consider later durations of this grant. Um, as again, for a competitive application, you must have a minimum of three years of experience. Um, and lastly, language skills. Um, as I will go through here shortly, some countries might have a language requirement. Um, and so with that, language skills will, uh, will be, would be necessary in that situation. All right, so now I'm going to get into a list of the participating regions and countries. Uh, so first off, the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship is in three world regions uh, uh, around the world, uh, Africa, East Asia, and the Pacific, and the West and the Western Hemisphere. Uh, currently, as, as I noted earlier, that there, there I, oh, goodness, <laughs> currently, as I noted earlier, uh, there are 10 countries being offered. Uh, in Africa, it's Botswana, Ghana, and Rwanda. In East Asia and the Pacific, it's Cambodia, Fiji, Thailand, Timor-Leste, and Vietnam. And in the Western Hemisphere, it's Colombia and Peru. Um, so really a whole a host of different countries that have certainly uh, different interests and needs. 
Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, I do want to note uh, what's our potential placements within these countries. And so I mentioned earlier that um, you would be working as, you know, if selected, you would be working as a technical specialist in a host government or ministry. Now, it's important to note that in these host governments and ministries, um, you are placed by the U.S. Embassy. And so with that in mind, um, we do have a list of potential host ministries. Um, there are other institutions and ministries outside those that are listed that you could um, be placed in. Uh, flexibility is required for the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship. As the host government might say, your skills are better, you know, of better use in a different institution. Um, so that's something to keep in mind in the application, and I'll note that a little bit later here in the application components and tips. But nevertheless, I do want to go over the potential host ministries um, as outlined in our awards. Uh, so firstly, you know, in Botswana, they're looking for a whole, you know, a whole host of um, potential ministries anywhere, you know, from labor uh, and employment to home affairs, youth, sport, and culture, as well as basic and tertiary education. The language is, uh, English is an official language there, so it is not necessary to have additional language requirements or additional language skills. Uh, Ghana, similarly, English is an official language, and they have, a, a you know, again, different potential host ministries ranging from health to lands and natural resources, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Tourism, Arts, and Culture. In Rwanda, English is also an official language, but if you have additional fluency in French or Kenya Rwanda, um, it is certainly helpful, but not required. Um, so again, you know, if you want to stand out and you do have those language skills, I would encourage you to consider Rwanda. Uh, potential host ministries um, vary from Ministry of Health to Ministry of Local Government and the Rwanda Social Security Board. Again, as I noted, these are potential host ministries. Um, there are certainly places outside those listed that you can um, select within your application. Moving on to the East Asia and the Pacific. Um, Cambodia, um, one potential host ministry listed is the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts. Um, English is sufficient, but if you know Keimer, um, it is uh, certainly encouraged, uh, but not required. Uh, Fiji does have English as an official language, and potential host ministries include um, you know, environments and waterways, economy, forestry, and agriculture. Uh, in Thailand, English is sufficient, and Thai is not required. Uh, potential host ministries vary from public health to education, science, research, and innovation, um, and things related to the National Vaccine Institute, as well as their Food and Drug Administration. In Timor-Leste, um, Portuguese is encouraged, um, although not required. I definitely encourage folks to consider Timor-Leste, as certainly this is one of our uh, newest uh, additions, not only to the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship, but to the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program uh, writ large. So this is a new opportunity. Uh, potential host ministries there include health, agriculture and fisheries, public works, and higher education. And finally, in this region, we have Vietnam. Uh, potential host ministries are the education Ministry of Education uh, or Health or Agriculture, and English is sufficient, but again, Vietnamese language proficiency is encouraged but not required. And moving on to our final um, region, uh, this is the Western Hemisphere with both Colombia and Peru. So what's really important to note about the Western Hemisphere is that advanced Spanish is required. So if you do have these language skills um, with, you know, if you have as I noted, the eligibility requirements before, where you have, um, you know, serious, uh, you know, that minimum of three years of public policy related experience, as well as a graduate degree um, and advanced Spanish, I would certainly encourage you to apply for these uh, to either of these uh, countries. As you know, you can see here, uh, and especially in Peru, um, they have a long list of, of uh, potential host institutions um, that are not, you know, only within the government, but some are certainly outside and related to it. Um, Colombia, uh, similarly, has different institutions listed as well. Um, so I cannot emphasize this enough. These are simply the potential host ministries. If you yourself think that your skill sets, as you are experts in your field, uh, would be better noted in a, you know, a different uh, host ministry, I would encourage you to list that host ministry in your application then, uh, simply uh, to demonstrate that indeed you feel that, you know, your skill set would be uh, best to, you know, address uh, what is perhaps a need in that uh, space.
So getting into the application itself. Um, so we have five application components for the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship, one of which is the application uh, form itself. Uh, this is, again, all online. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, but probably the, the crux of the application is uh, are the essay questions. I'll, in the next slide, I'll explain what those look like. Uh, but the essay questions really are your chance to explain um, your skill sets, how your skills can apply to that host ministry, um, and ultimately how you would work as a cultural ambassador. Um, this is really important to note that, of course, um, you know, the Fulbright program's mission is about mutual understanding. Uh, and with that in mind, you would be, a, you know, an, an ambassador of the United States, um, even on your day-to-day -day work. Um, so, of course, we're not only looking for um, really highly qualified candidates with that public policy um, experience and degree, uh, but also folks who can demonstrate that they would be great cultural ambassadors. Um, you'd also, you also have to upload a CV or a resume, um, and two letters of reference are required and only two. So keep this in mind um, that you must have uh, those two letters. Uh, something to note with the letters of reference um, is that I encourage folks who do know that they want to apply uh, to get those in as soon as possible. Um, I'll note here that the deadline is September 15th, 2023 for the 2024-2025 academic year. Um, so nevertheless, make sure that you, you know, have, um, the, you can certainly start your application and submit those uh, requests for those letters of reference, um, even after you submit your application. Uh, but nevertheless, start early. <laughs> I can't emphasize that enough, especially with your letters of reference. Um, and lastly, a language proficiency report and evaluation. So as I noted, uh, Colombia and Peru have, require advanced Spanish. Um, and so with those two countries, you would have to submit a language proficiency report and evaluation, uh, which is the two-part process, uh, one of which is the self-evaluation, and the second part is the external evaluation. Um, so keep this, this is an, another component that I encourage folks to uh, get in as soon as possible. Um, for the other countries, if you will, you know, apply to those other particular uh, places, um, and you do know the, that language skill, uh, language skills. I would still encourage you to submit a um, self-evaluation as well as well as an external language evaluation, um, um, just because that demonstrates, of course, that you have that skill sets and that language um, to excel um, if you were to be selected uh, as a Fulbright Public Policy Fellow. So, getting into um, you know the essay questions. Um, as I noted uh, that there are, you know, there are several short essays uh, to explain your specific strengths and your motivations. Um, you only have certain, uh, you know, certain length uh, for each uh, question. So it's around about 1500 characters uh, for each. So keep that in mind that, you know, these are very short essays. Um, and so, you know, you have to be really thoughtful about uh, what you want to highlight and which words you want to use. So with the experience, you know, the first question, uh, the first part of these questions will address your experience and skills, your career tra trajectory, the country selection, preparation and impact, and of course, your professional project. Uh, what is that 20 percent, you know, you plan on doing um, in country to benefits, you know, your career as well as, um, you know, perhaps the community itself. So keep that in mind. Um, these are really important aspects um, of the um, essay questions. So tips to submit a strong application. This is something I get often is, you know, Keegan, how to how do I stand out? Um, and that's a really great question. You know, first off, reading the actual FPPF website, reading the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship Award, uh, which I'll explain in, in, in the next two in next few slides here, um, is really critical. Um, I have a lot of, you know, applicants who have said, um, Keegan, you know, I really want to go to um, Egypt, um, how can I submit my application? And I say, well, unfortunately, Egypt is not offered, you know, uh, this year. So that's really important is to know um, what countries are, are offered, um, what's possible. And I do, you know, encourage folks as experts to think about your own skill set in that way. You know, is there a particular country that you have um, experience with or experience in that you can highlight. Um, again, you are the experts here. I only know so much about public policy in a lot of, uh, in a very general sense. Uh, and so, you know, as experts, think about where your skill set could really make the biggest impact. And that's really key. Um, additionally, start your application early. Um, as I noted before, please, you know, enter those 
um, references, uh, you know, information as soon as possible. Because, um, of course, you can always save and return to your application. But also, you know, this way you get a sense of what your application looks like. As you complete your application, more, uh, more information will populate. So, you know, as you go through the application, you will see exactly what you need to do and what you need to complete. We really make it easy for you as a step-by-step -step process to address um, what is possible. And lastly, um, you know, if you have additional questions outside of this information session, I do host Ful Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship office hours. And so it's really um, just an hour where, you know, folks can join and if they have questions, um, I will be there to help, you know, address any inquiries, um, discuss, you know, um, you know, whatever is on your mind in that in that sense regarding the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship uh, and so on. Uh, we, my, myself, my team, we are happy to help you. And of course, we do have, you know, alumni that you are, in, if you are interested in, um, I'll, again, in, in a few moments here, I'll uh, share my screen to the Fulbright Public Policy uh, Fellowship uh, listings within the Scholar Directory, and you can see uh, past projects of, um, you know, alums. Uh, and this is also important to note, uh, finally, is that you can only receive one award. And this is in the sense of, you know, you can only, firstly, you can only receive an award if you apply. So I encourage you to apply. But I want to note that, you know, I get this question frequently is, um, you know, Keegan, can I apply to both the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program, you know, with the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship um, and the Fulbright U.S. Student Program? And in short, the answer is no. Uh, you can only apply to one award. So, of course, you know, I encourage applicants to think, especially as a lot of folks would still qualify for, for the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, to decide which award is best for them. Um, so, again, you know, we can happy to discuss that later, uh, but keep that in mind. So, a little bit about the timeline. Uh, our competition launched in uh, February of this year. Uh, so, certainly, we are... Um, on the fast track to uh, that deadline, uh, which is September 15th, 2023. Uh, so if you haven't written that down, uh, make sure that's there. Um, again, you know, applications are due uh, September 15th, 2023 at 11.59 uh, Pacific time. Um, I, of course, encourage you to not wait to the last minute to do this, um, as certainly, you know, I would hate for, you know, the system to crash uh, or so on, or, you know, letters of reference not be able to make it on time or whatever that may be. Um, again, the earlier, you know, for your sanity and, of course, ours, I encourage you to apply uh, as soon as possible. Um, after applications are submitted, uh, what happens then is you go, uh, your application then goes to a peer review committee uh, where experts within uh, public policy will review the applications and make recommendations uh, to uh, the uh, in-country uh, portion of whether or not uh, you should be uh, selected. Um, so then your application will then uh, travel, uh, you know, if you are recommended, your application will then go to, again, the U.S. embassies or the bi binational Fulbright commissions. Uh, they will review the recommended applications. Um, there may be um, virtual interviews, so keep that in mind. That's a, a possibility. Um, and ultimately, they will consult with the host government uh, ministry about the list of candidates. And then so successful candidates are then nominated for ultimate selection. In January of 2024, the recommended candidates are then reviewed by the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board for approval. And then anywhere in February to March 2024, I would expect more closer to March 2024, uh, that scholars, uh, or rather Fulbright Public Policy Fellows, um, will be announced following the U.S. Embassy Host Ministry Placements um, negotiations. And with that, um, once you, you know, if you're selected, congratulations. Uh, it's great. You can then start your journey. Um, in July 2024, there will be a pre-departure orientation to um, help you get acclimated to go through the process of what it looks like um, to actually, um, you know, execute your uh, fellowship appropriately. And then anywhere from July 2024 to March 2025, uh, fellows will depart for their host countries. So again, um, you can find that information on our website, um, which speaking of which, I, I will share my screen here in just a moment um, to the website. But I did want to note that there are two parts of uh, the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship on the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program uh, website, one of which on the left here is the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship um, web page itself. We have a dedicated web page um, that, you know, does go in, in uh, depth about the um, 
about FPPF. Um, but we also here on the right have the award within our award catalog. Um, so there are two different places to find information. Um, the reason why I post, you know, I share both is that in the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship Award, it does go into a little bit about the award benefits. Um, this is a common question I get, you know, Keegan, I know I'm not a volunteer and just doing this for free. Um, what does this look like? Um, how will I sustain myself um, while I'm executing our grants? Um, in short, you know, it's uh, the award benefits differ um, from country to country. Um, in short, this is because we understand that, um, you know, certainly the amount of money required to execute a project, um, a fellowship within Colombia might be very different than, say, in Fiji. And so we know that the grants uh, award benefits will differ. And so what I recommend folks do is look actually at the awards of other, you know, awards within that country. So look at the Fulbright of Scholar Awards to Columbia, for example, to see more about the range of, of that um, monthly allowance. Uh, so keep that in mind. But I will, before going to the website, I do We'll share more contact information. Don't worry, I'll come back to this so you can have this up uh, on the ready. You don't have to take any uh, screenshots or you know take any photos, but um, you know to stay connected with the Fulbright uh, Scholar Program as well as the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship. Um, firstly, you know of course you are welcome to email myself at fppf at iie.org. That's the best way to get in contact. Um, if you have any you know questions about um, fppf, I'd be happy to answer um, answer them to the best of my abilities. Of course, joining an office hour, we do have Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship specific office hours uh, once a month. Um, we have, of course, the Fulbright program is on all uh, different platforms, you know, several different platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, um, not only for the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship, but, you know, learning more about the uh, both U.S. scholar and U.S. student experiences uh, writ large. It's really a great way to um, kind of get a glimpse of uh, what that in-country experience could be. So with that, I will um, give me one moment as I'm going to stop sharing and then share again to show you the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship website. So uh, give me a moment here. And I'll show you where to find different resources, one of which the website's uh, Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship website, as well as the Scholar Directory. Um, really great ways to learn more about FPPF. So with that, Great, Carmen, can you see my uh, screen? Great, thank you. So yeah, so um, FulbrightScholars.org, one of my favorite websites. I highly encourage you to take a, take a look if you have the chance. Uh, if you click underneath awards, we do have the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship uh, listed specifically. And again, this is really a, the one-stop shop for a lot of information uh, regarding you know, an overview of participating countries, grant details. We've also had a different webinar in the beginning of the competition. Uh, the timeline, uh, which I've noted already, eligibility, application steps, and of course, the review process. Again, this is really important if you're looking to create a competitive application, um, diving a little bit more into, again, thinking about potential impacts, thinking about your own work experience and how that relates to FPPF. Um, if you want to see the award, you can go to the Fulbright U.S. Scholars um, as an award, the U.S. Scholar Award Search. You can you know, simply type in public policy or you can um, you know, search uh, through the country specific, uh, you know, again, if you're looking for Botswana, you can search through Botswana and that will come up. But if you look under Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship, it will tell you a little bit more about say the award length, um, again, it, you know, it dives into the information about the uh, host countries, the host placements, um, and so on. Um, so this is something to, to, note, to take note of. And lastly, if you want to find more information about alums, the Scholar Directory, which is under Connect, is really a great place to go. So type if you type uh, select a program, Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship is listed as one of them. And you can see the fellows who have I've done the project pro the project in the past few years. As you can see, the programs have changed. So things have changed since 2019, but here are certainly a list of folks and you can get, you know, you can, we don't have contact information there, but you can reach out to them through a simple Google search. You might find them on LinkedIn or find some contact information. All right, I've spoken a lot and I wanna hear from you. And I know that there are uh, questions in the ch chat, which is really great. So. Um, Armin, if you could, if you could get to the questions, I would be 
happy to answer them. Sure. Um, just to kick off a few nuts and bolts questions. First, uh, Keegan, are you comfortable sharing your slides with us in addition to this recording after the presentation? Yes, I would be happy to. Great. Excellent. Second, again, fairly nuts and bolts question. Obviously, the program is called the Public Policy Fellowship, but international affairs degrees very much fall into that space. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as I noted before, you know, this is, um, you could have a degree, you know, a master's in agriculture, right? And, you know, so on. Um, as long as it has, a, you know, a public policy, you know, focus, and that can mean a lot of different things, right? You know, this is why we really cast a wide net in that sense. Um, I know, Carmen, we've talked about maybe, you know, should the name, should be should it be public policy or should it be the policy fellowship? Of course, more on that later. But nevertheless, you know, if you have um, education, you know, a degree within international affairs or international studies, um, you have that experience and, you know, you yourself think you can be a great cultural ambassador, then I would encourage you to apply. Um, of course, you know, I think the folks that have that, you know, that skill set, that international focus um, certainly can help, um, you know, whatever that host country's uh, needs look like. Wonderful. Um, and then on terms of the application and eligibility criteria, for that four to nine months of experience, um, or excuse me, the four to nine month length of service, is that something that the candidate themselves decides? Is that something the host decides? How does that shape out how long you'll be gone? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in short, the answer is the candidates, the, the applicant, they are the ones who decide the length of the, uh, the grant. So it really is up to you to, to think about, you know, how long that could look. Um, and, and, and I say this because you, you have two aspects, right? The technical specialist role and your own professional policy, that 20% of the professional policy um, project. And I think of this in terms of a, of a work week, right? Where four days you're expected to be a technical specialist working in that host ministry or institution. And then that fifth day will be you doing a public, you know, um, or yeah, that public uh, policy related professional project. And so again, you know, it's up to you to decide what that length looks like. If you think that, and and I really and I mention this because it's uh, oftentimes applicants use that that professional project to kind of guide them to say, okay, I think that you know what I would like to do regarding a professional project, uh, which again can be a lot of things. It can be you know anywhere from um, you know doing like a workshop or mentoring or, you know, so on. I mean, really the sky's the limit when it comes to these professional projects um, and, you know, how that can relate to not only, you know, your career, but perhaps impacting the, the you know, the country. But, you know, if you think that your, your project could be, you know, done in five months, great. If you think you need nine months, great. I mean, it really is up to you, but I simply encourage you to justify in your application, especially when it talks about that professional project, why you would need that time. Frame. Um, and that's, you know, a really great way to say, okay, um, you know, I, and, and also in terms, of course, of the, the technical specialist role, if you say, okay, you know, I know in Fiji, they have, you know, this issue, I am an expert in that issue. And therefore, I think it would take this long to, you know, to help, you know, created some sort of new, new initiative or push something along, or if you knew something that's going happening, you know, is happening already and you can contribute to that, great. But really try to, you know, reflect and kind of tease that out, um, uh, you know, regarding your own skill set. That's great advice. Um, for the countries in particular that have English as an official language or where English is, is the required language, do students have to, or do you recommend that students also prove that they are native and fluent English speakers, much as they might have to do if it was Spanish? Yeah, I, you know what's funny is I actually never received that question, um, but I would have to say uh, the answer is no. Um, you know, we only the the these are only for languages outside of English, um, and so you wouldn't you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to even if English is not your first language. Um, fundamentally, you would not have to complete a a language, self language evaluation or um, an external language evaluation. Um, you know, so the answer is no. Um, you want you want that wouldn't be necessary um, for if it's you know in that case if English is that official language of that particular host country. Um, again, just for you know languages outside of English, and even if it's not a language necessarily related, um, it is up to you to you know 
decide if you want to put that on there. It's, of course, a personal decision to say, okay, perhaps highlighting this can showcase that I have language experiences or the ability to, um, you know, use that language, a language, you know, that might show that, okay, okay, you're an expert um, in, you know, grasping foreign languages. And that can certainly, you know, highlight that you have the ability to be a cultural ambassador or willing to, um, you know, have an international mindset already. Again, that's a personal decision. That's, an, you know, that's if, you know, if you're going to Rwanda and you know Portuguese, you know, it's up to you to decide if you want to list that um, and, you know, fill out that form, of course, you know, but needless to say, I, it's something to consider, especially regarding the review criteria. That's an interesting juxtaposition with some other fellowship programs where they encourage you to list English as a fluent language um, and not get screened out in that way. So um, good, good question, folks. Um, in terms of the three to five years of required experience, do internships count towards that time and how do they count? Yeah, that's that's a very common question, I guess. And so a lot of it's, you know, in short, I don't necessarily have a great answer because it's on the onus is on the applicants of a cumulative amount of experience, right? So if you think that's your in, in short, I we we do consider that experience, right? Like if that's if that what's is what gets you to that three years of experience, then I would encourage you to you know, <laughs> include that. Um, because of course that ultimately will be on your resume hypothetically anyways, that you have that experience. Mm -hmm. So that will be something that will be noted. And we will ask within the application to, you know, of course, puts, you know, what is the, what are past public policy experiences you've had? And certainly I'm sure you will note it anyways. Um, so indeed they do count. Um, you know, ideally we are looking for folks who have had, you know, experience outside of their graduate degree, um, you know, that have had more experience. I, I think certainly, again, you know, that three to five years of relevant experience is just that, it's relevant experience. Um, and it's more of the, the amount of experience um, than necessarily what that, you know, entails. So, of course, if you've had, you know, three years of experience interning at some sort of institution, um, whether that be, I don't know, the U.S. government or an NGO or so on, great, you know, that's wonderful, um, and so on. But uh, again, you know, fundamentally, it has to be a year of three years. That's 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 a hard minimum. <laughs> um, and so, yes, you know, you can use that those internships to get there, to get to that amount. Thank you. In terms of the letters of reference, are there preferences or requirements in terms of how many are professional, how many are academic, and do you have advice on who makes a good recommender? Yeah, well, I'll start with the second question because I think that can answer the first one. Um, in short, you know, whenever whenever I receive that question, we always encourage applicants to think about who can speak to their abilities best. I think there is, you know, from my own time working here, that there's an there is, um, I think there's almost like an inclination where applicants want to say, okay, I know this person with this title, you know. Will that make it, you know, will that be a stronger, you know, letter than someone who doesn't, you know, who doesn't have that title, you know? Um, and in short, I will then re retort and say, can they speak to your abilities well? You know, can the president speak to your abilities well? <laughs> um, because if that's the case, then yes, I would encourage you to, you, you know, have them as an applicant or as a reference. Um, and I say this because I, I really do recommend that applicants have folks who can speak best to their abilities. You know, we're not here looking for heuristics. We want, again, folks of diverse backgrounds, you know, regardless. And so having letters that really can talk to, you know, what you have done, perhaps in this relevant experience, that's what makes a strong reference letter. Um, that someone who is excited about your abilities, who can talk about, you know, your skill set as it relates to the review criteria about you being a cultural ambassador, et cetera. You know, that's what matters. Um, and so, you know, there isn't, you know, outside of that, there aren't parameters on who that can be. Now, the one thing I do want to note is there is also another inclination for applicants to say, what if I solicited a letter of recommendation or a letter of reference from that host ministry? The answer is, please do not do that. Um, I, I, you know, was, we were very explicit in our, um, on the website as well as in the award that applicants should not reach out to the host ministries 
to advocate for placements. Um, and that includes, you know, again, I would I, I include the letters of reference within that. Um, because again, they should focus on, on you know, these letters should be focusing on your um, skill set and what you can contribute. Um, and so again, don't don't do that. That's not I please avoid that. I really, really recommend doing that, you know, not going down that route. Um, so in short, you know, anyone um, who, who perhaps a supervisor, you've worked closely, a colleague, I mean, um, it, it can be anyone that's that knows you best. Great advice in general. Um, a few questions on timing as well. You mentioned the timeline for application. Do students need to apply through their schools, like for some of the other Fulbright programs, or is it a direct application to you all? Yeah, that's a really great question. It is a direct application. So because this is through the Fulbright US Scholar Program, you do not need to apply through your institution. And so indeed, it is simply just a direct application um, through our through the Fulbright US Scholar website. Um, again, now something to note, of course, is that you know be sure that you're looking on the Fulbright US Scholar uh, websites. Um, I know that's I've you know I've come across um, an inquiry where it said you know I can't find. Um, it doesn't say Ful Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship. Um, and that's because, you know, folks have went to the Fulbright U.S. student side, which, of course, you know, it's an error. It's the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship used to be within the Fulbright U.S. student program. So things have changed. But indeed, you do not need to apply through your institution. That's great. I will note for our, our students, though, when Keegan shared the list of alumni, there's a good chance that some of those alum may have come through your school. So being in touch with your school seeing if there are alum you can talk to as a reference point. And instead of just blindly Googling them, going through your alumni office, going through the career office can be a great way to build those relationships, even if you not have to apply through the school itself. Another question on timing, if a student or if an applicant can only commit to that four month window, is that something that's gonna adversely affect their application or negatively impact them in some way? That's a really good question. Um, in short, the answer is no. Um, you know, we have that parameter because it is open up to, you know, to folks who can only apply to four months or folks who apply to nine months. Fundamentally, it should all be, it should be about your justification, right? So this is going to be highlighted within your essay questions where you say, okay, you know, I'm choosing this four month um, time frame because it's, you know, I feel that I can execute this project, this professional project, be a technical specialist in this role, address, you know, this you know issue or you know issues so you know so on within that time frame so i encourage applicants to focus about you know the look at it through the lens of the the um, um the needs of the institutions the ministries rather than the personal i can only do it for four months so that's something to note is is if you can only do it for four months four months then just simply you know think about okay why what can be done in that four month times you know time time frame um what, what would that look like um so that's you know that's what i recommend thank you also on the timing you had given us some examples of the ministries where scholars may be placed and then in the application materials you encouraged folks to really link their application to the ministries that they would be serving with or hoping to be served hope to serve with when do folks find out what ministries are eligible so that they can best craft that application and, and make those connections? That's a really good question. And so in short, so when it comes to the the you know, the placement processes, these are often, you know, okay, so let's take a step back here. We'll go on a little bit of a journey. So if you are, say, you know, you are, you go, your application goes to the peer review, you are recommended to the in-country review. And you are ultimately then selected. And a part of that process is being, you know, is the US Embassy or the Fulbright Commission negotiating with that host government to place you. And so fundamentally, you know, all host ministries are eligible because again, these are only potential host. I, I listed potential host ministries because this is, you know, the governments, you know, the host governments have initially said, here are some preferences. These are, you know, placement preferences we have. But they also, you know, we understand that, of course, we, you know, there's 12 different or 10 different governments, you know, linking these applicants in the U.S. And that is it's a bit of a process. So 
with that in mind, we we do note that you can you know have a host ministry outside of those listed. You can apply you know to one outside uh, you know because that might be where you are placed. You know, ultimately, as I noted in Cambodia, that's a prime example of um, the in Cambodia they have only the Ministry of um, Culture and Tourism, but you can you know. If you say, look, I actually am a public policy expert in public health, and therefore there's this particular issue that I think is, you know, acute, um, and, you know, based on my experience, I know that I, you know, have a lot of skill sets that would be really useful in this situation. Um, you can apply for the Ministry of Health to Cambodia, and you could be selected. I mean, it's quite possible that you present a really stellar application and you justify, you know, your skill sets and why you should be there for that duration and you so on. And that's quite possible. And so that's why we also, you know, encourage that. Alternatively, you could apply to, say, um, Peru and say, look, I am, you know, doing a project in public health. And they actually say, you know what, you know, we see that you applied for the Ministry of Health, but we actually think your skill set would be best, you know, in this subsidiary, you know, institution related to maybe, you know, food and drug administration or, you know, so on. So that's why we, it is important that you are applying to, you know, the ministry that you are best suited for, that you as experts feel that you are best suited for, um, because it's quite possible that, you know, your position can change. And I encourage folks to note that, you know, within your essay questions, it don't, you don't have to spare more than, I would say, a sentence. I would encourage you to really keep it at a minimum to say, look, I understand that flexibility is required in the placement process and therefore understand my skill sets might be applied elsewhere. Um, and so again, mention that, but it, fundamentally when you get to the application it will ask you for the institution um, and you can type in an institution that is not listed. And that's why we, we say that is because you can, you know, within our application, you have the possibility and within the placement process, you have the possibility um, of being placed elsewhere. So again, these are only potential. These are only preferences. <laughs> so by all means, all host ministries are eligible. So it really sounds like it's about making that case for skills and, and maybe topics more than one particular office um, or one particular institution. Um, Keegan, if you don't mind, could you go back please to the uh, eligibility criteria really quickly? We have just a couple other questions. Um, and I wanted to make sure folks had a chance to see this. So obviously mm -hmm. the graduate degree in a policy related field, does it have to be in hand? Can you still be a student when you apply? What is the timing that you recommend there? Yes, so you can be a, a student um, like when you apply. Simply put, you have to have your graduate degree before your um, grants would start. So this is why, so this is really important because you could, if say you're in a two-year program and you're going to be graduating in May of 2024 uh, or the spring of 2024, um, the, you know, the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship competition um, for this year is for the 2024-2025 academic year. So as I noted um, earlier, that's, oh, uh, 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 let's see here, the time. So here, July 2024 to March 2025, that is when scholars would depart for their host country. So that's the time frame. That's when you can do your grant. Um, your, your grant can begin during anywhere in that time frame. So say that you are graduating in May of 2024, you can very much still apply you know, while you are still in school. Does that Thank answer you. that question? Yes, um, perfect. Okay. Um, and then... Back. One other combination of questions. So I see here that it's listed as relevant experience. How directly relevant does it have to be? Or is it mostly just about how you make the case that your expertise will contribute to whatever host institution you, you put down on your application? Uh, definitely the, the latter than the former. Um, so indeed, it is about the case, right? Making the case of like, okay, you know, what is my, you know, what is my skill sets? How can that apply? And again, this, this is really, you know, every application is different. There is no, um, 
no application, there's no, you know, example of an application that is, you know, that's the golden ticket. That's, you know, the winner because every applicant is different and has a different skill set. Um, and I, and I mean that seriously in the sense of your relevant experience could really, you know, really vary. You could have, you know, you did, you did internships, um, and gosh, I don't know, public health, but now you are, you know, completely on a different track. Um, but perhaps, you know, when it comes to your application, you know, if you have a, a thread or a strand that relates to that experience or that you can justify, again, that you can justify, that's the, that's really the key, Carmen, um, as you've noted, is that, you know, if you, you can make the argument that you have, you know, that skill set that you gained, and that can really apply to a lot of different scenarios um, from that relevant experience, then that becomes relevant. Um, if you, so think about how you can transfer your skills. That's <laughs> full stop. <laughs> <laughs> always important, always important. Um, three more, hopefully, um, easy questions for you, Keegan. Um, we'll, we'll save the hard ones for another time. Um, first, can you apply to more than one ministry on your application, or do you just have to pick one? Yes, you can only apply to just one. Uh, but again, I encourage you to note in your application that you understand flexibility might be necessary for the placement process. Understand flexibility, adaptability, hallmarks of APSIA students, absolutely. Um, in terms of experience in the country to which you're applying, is that an asset? Is that a detriment? How is that looked on by the committee? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it, again, it goes back to, um, it goes back to, I would say, two things, first of which is justification, right? So understanding, um, you know, that your experience, you know, that experience in country can benefit, you know, you know, you have obviously have some familiarity, it can now benefits, you know, um, what you do. So that's, that, that's one aspect, right, where it's like, okay, can you highlight that? How can you highlight that in your application? Um, but the other aspect too, um, and especially, you know, if if you have, you know, contacts um, or, you know, folks, if your uncle works in the host ministry, um, I think that's where it gets a little dicey in the sense of, okay, you know, why do you need to, why do you need a Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship, right? If you have these connections, this experience, seemingly if you can do a lot of work in country without Fulbright, then why Fulbright? So that's kind of where, you know, there's, it's definitely a spectrum uh, to keep in mind. Now, of course, you know, I know that might not be the case for everyone. I think a lot of applicants, you know, simply have, I know I studied abroad in Cartagena for, you know, a summer doing intensive Spanish, but now I want to go there. <laughs> what does it look like? Great, that's relevant experience because you now know the language and maybe you did an internship and so on. Uh, for the most part, it falls in the you know the, the first half where it's you know relevant experience. Um, but again, just kind of keep that in mind. Why Fulbrights? Um, if you've had significant amounts of experience in country. Thank you. And then my last question to you is, with the choices that students and young professionals may have to make between applying for a fellowship program, applying for a job, pursuing different opportunities, why should they choose something like this fellowship program? instead of a, a more classic route or a route that at least makes their parents less nervous in the grocery store? That's that's a very good question. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I would say that uh, applying is a personal choice. Um, I think what's unique, of course, about the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship is the opportunity to be within a, a different government's institution. Um, there is not a fellowship like this. Uh, truly where you can work um, in that capacity in a foreign government. Um, and so, you know, really this is in that regard, it's like, okay, you know, what, how can this benefit my career? And that's, again, that's part of the essay questions is how can this benefit my career? There's a lot of reflection required for our applicants because, you know, we're asking a lot for a U.S. citizen to go and, you know, build some sort of capacity or help, you know, initiatives or, you know, apply their skills. That's a big ask. And again, it's a personal decision to say, okay, you know, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do this. But of course, you know, time and time again, it's a transformational experience. You know, I have a Fulbright Public Policy Fellow uh, alum who, you know, she was fantastic. She did work in Peru for, um, gosh, I think it was um, eight months. Um, and she ended up doing, uh, her work was in public health. And she did a lot about, um, you know, her own research was about um, uh, drug testing 
and you know different policy related to um, uh, like you know drug abuse and like how that's treatment you know treatments and so on. And so her work in Peru was really fascinating because she worked to worked with the government to standardize that because it was really you know there's a lot of disparities in the rural areas versus urban areas and so on. So she got to travel all over you know working with different hospitals and clinics to you know work on standard procedures and so like that you know so you know very much like that. And it was very impactful. A part of her experience, she ended up going to different conferences, you know, outside of Peru and to speak about her work um, because it really was helpful. It was groundbreaking. Um, and for her, it opened up a lot of doors because she, you know, <laughs> professionally, she was able to do something that, you know, no other program, um, you know, provided the space for the opportunity to do. And so with that, you know, I this that's the, the time where you get to think big, you know, dream and say, OK. What can I do? You know, if I had this under my belts, you know, if I, you know, could do this initiative or, you know, execute this program, um, how could that, you know, come back to, you know, further my career, or make connections, or so on? And again, every person's different, you know. But certainly, um, I know with her story, she got a really, you know, awesome job later on, <laughs> and so for that, it's, you know, she's really grateful. Has made a lot of connections and helped with her work. That's true. This is a distinct space to get to do those kind of things that that you don't get to do in a classic nine to five job sort of sort of role. Um, one last clarifying question snuck in, and then we'll turn everybody loose. Um, you mentioned you can't apply for more than one Fulbright at the same time. Uh, can you apply for a student grant and this fellowship because it's technically a scholar grant, or do they exclude each other? Yeah, unfortunately, they do exclude each other. So you would have to apply for either the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship within the, the Scholar Program, or a say a U.S. student grant. So that, that's why you know again I encourage folks um, in this position to really think if you haven't had a lot of experience, for example, I would if you know if you've had a year or two years of experience, but say you want to do research or something to that you know that sort, then I would encourage you to apply more so for the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. Now, if you've had that, if you have that, those three years of experience, I would certainly encourage you to apply for the Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship. Now, I will say, of course, you know, so far, it doesn't look like the program will be going away anytime soon. So, of course, it's okay if you say, you know, maybe this is something better for me later on, um, you know, and of course, uh, there's plenty of people who have applied for a Fulbright U.S. student grant and then later on applied for the Fulbright U.S. scholar grant. Um, that's possible. So it happens um, a lot more than people realize. <laughs> Such a great opportunity. They, they got to do it twice. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you so much, Keegan, for walking us through this fantastic opportunity. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees for being here and all of these wonderful questions, uh, including some he's never heard before. So that's definitely a win. And we look forward to seeing all of you at future APSIA webinars and hopefully uh, having you flood Keegan's inbox with lots of inquiries and fabulous applications to compete for this opportunity. Have a great rest of your day, everybody, wherever you happen to be, and we'll see you at a future APSIA webinar. Take care. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks.